Welcome to the Climate Report. This is Hart Hagen, and I'm here with my lovely daughter, Catherine Hagen. Catherine, how are you doing? Hi, I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. So Catherine is an interior designer based in Atlanta, and I'm thrilled that she wants to join me today for our climate conversation. And uh, so how, how do you want to start, Catherine? Well, I guess we'll get right into it. Um, definitely have some questions. Every time I talk to you about climate change, I'm always learning something new. Um, I know that you did come up with uh, five strategies, or it is something you came up with, right? Five different strategies to rehydrate the earth. Right. Um, so could you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. Let, let me start with my standard introduction to the climate report. So the climate report, the purpose of the climate report, I've done like you know, 315 audio episodes. I've done uh, dozens of video episodes via Zoom. The purpose of the climate report is to actually solve the problem of climate change, all things considered. So, you know, it includes the, the power dynamics. We have to understand how power works. We have to understand how the physical world works. We have to take into account the biological world, not just the physical world. So uh, what I, uh, let me get to those five strategies in just a minute. Let me start by talking about, uh, I have two items here, broadly speaking. The first item is what we usually hear about climate change. And the second uh, item is heart solution. Speaking only for myself, you know, how would I solve this problem? How do I recommend solving this problem? So on, for, as far as what we hear from the mainstream, uh, you know, by mainstream, I'm talking about you know, mainstream media, New York Times, Washington Post, Wall, Wall Street Journal, and also the climate media, such as like Inside Climate News. And what we hear is this is a problem that is almost solely caused by carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. And what we hear is that we need to reduce fossil fuels. And uh, we also hear that, okay, we need to implement solar power. We need to implement wind power. These things are called re you know, renewable energy or alternative fuels. We also hear that we need to have a plant-based diet. And I have some things to say about that. I don't think that's going in the right direction. We also hear people promoting electric vehicles and there are these high ticket projects called geoengineering that we can talk about and also carbon capture and storage. We, we, uh, but the, the thing that unite, unifies all these is that they're, they're corporate products, they're profitable products, they require lots of government subsidies they don't require very much at all understanding of the biological world. So anyway, does, is, is that consistent with what you hear, Catherine? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, uh, you know, the more you look into everything, it just seems like some things seem to have sort of an agenda to it, um, you know, especially when the main media uh, pushes these things, you almost wonder what is their goal. Um, and a lot of these uh, goals seem to land on a profitable product that might or might not work. Mm -hmm. So now let, let's talk about heart solutions. Uh, to me, you know, CO2 is an issue and we need to deal with CO2. But if I had to put, it's like, how much of a problem is CO2 and greenhouse gases versus everything else? And I would put about a 20% figure on that. I'm pulling that out of the air. Yeah. I can't prove that. But what we normally hear is, wow, greenhouse gases are so big, so bad, so ominous. It's more like we get the impression that greenhouse gases are more like 80% of the problem. We have to deal with greenhouse gases. We have to reduce fossil fuels. I think we should reduce fossil fuels, but I don't think we can work. I don't think anybody in the mainstream climate movement has a plan for doing that in the relevant time frame. And, you know, reducing fossil fuels and reducing CO2 is not something that's going to cure these extreme climate events. Like when you see droughts, floods, hurricanes, 
wildfires, they say, oh, this is because of climate change. And okay, it's because of climate change, but I think climate change has multiple causes. Part of it is greenhouse gases. Part of it is what we've done to the land, deforestation, wrong kind of agriculture, lots of paving, lots of bare ground, which create hot plates. And so, uh, plus I think water has the potential to cool the planet overall much quicker than this, you know, long-term project, which is limiting and drawing down greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. Not to mention that, um, you know, a huge way they're, you know, trying to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases is electric cars, but then that runs into other issues, like how the demand for titanium is going to skyrocket. Um, and it just, there's just, just seems like uh, a lot of these solutions for reducing CO2 is really only possibly plateauing the problem um, or slowing down the problem, but not necessarily reversing the problem. What do you mean plateauing the problem? Um, and not even necessarily plateauing the problem, but um, it seems like a lot of, uh, you know, the solutions, you know, trying to reverse to renewable energy. And like you said, this is like a long, it's going to be a long process. And, uh, you know, even if we achieve uh, some of that, you know, it's only going to slow down the amount of CO2 going into the air so much. It, um, it just seems like some of these solutions aren't necessarily reversible uh, versus uh, some of the, the five strategies that you offer. It seems like, uh, you know, such as um, planting forests again, it just seems like that will more so reverse the problem. Mm -hmm. So let, let's talk about, you know, uh, solar energy and, and electric cars. Uh, these, these are things like electric cars. Why wouldn't we completely transform the transportation? Do we need electric cars? You know, do we want to put more cars on the road? You know, our transportation system is only one of the many like industries and sectors of the economy that is designed by and for the ruling classes. The you know, cars generally take Americans upwards of $8,000 per year to own and operate. The purpose of that is not transportation. The purpose of that is to extract money from us. So you can see how GM and Tesla want to sell us more electric cars because it's a good, you know, it, they're, they're extracting money from us. And, and the, uh, another question is, are electric cars, you know, how, how much less polluting are they? I, I heard a, you know, a, a presentation from an economist by the name of Richard Smith, who uh, says that, you know, the pollution caused by a car, 60% of it is before it even rolls off the assembly line. Most of the pollution caused by cars is not what comes out of the tailpipe. 60% is the manufacturing process. 10% is the disposal process. You've only got that 30 cent 30% in the middle that relates to the useful life of the car. So how much are we really reducing pollution or carbon emissions by electric cars? And I, you know, when I think of electric cars, these are luxury automobiles. These are luxury consumer products. And it's like other consumer products. They've always got more bells and whistles. This year's is better than last year's. And it's different from last year's. And it takes this huge massive supply chain besides which most of the people in this world do, are, are, are never going to be able to buy a luxury product like that and when you have people living on a few dollars per day how is it going to help their life you know, how is it going to solve you know so just saying yeah i mean those are all good points it's just you run into other problems that's I, I find that very fascinating that you said um you know 50% of, um, how did you word it, uh, before it even runs off the lot? 60%, uh, according to Richard Smith, the, an economist, he said 60% of the pollution associated with a car occurs before it rolls off the assembly line. Mm -hmm. And that's comparing it to its whole lifetime that it gets used to, right? Yeah, that's, yes, 60% of its lifetime, like it's, a, it's called the life cycle analysis. Mm -hmm. out of its entire lifetime from 
from birth to use to disposal, mm -hmm. then 60% of the pollution associated with that entire life cycle is going to be the manufacturing process. Mm -hmm. and, and so it doesn't seem to be much of a solution, does it? Doesn't seem like it. Well, let's get into it. And you have similar issues related to solar power, wind power. If anybody wants to know, wants to get some provocative analysis of so-called renewable energy, I would recommend, I have like three or four resources in mind. One of them is the Michael Moore's movie, Planet of the Humans, mm -hmm. which got a lot of flack, a lot of bad press. I, I spent a lot of time in 2020 covering that movie and the response to it. And the people that were opposed to it, the people that were writing hit pieces on it, they, it was never fair. And they, you know, they never really did a good job of, uh, it just wasn't fair. It was like a bunch of straw man arguments and drama and uh, some of it just, so Plan of the Humans is a good resource. Another good book is called Green Illusions by Ozzy Zenner. And another really good book is Bright Green Lies by Lierre Keith and Derek Jensen. So this is, we, we go around with this impression that solar power and electric vehicles and wind power and lithium batteries, we go around with the impression that these things are clean, green and renewable. If you think those products are clean, green or renewable, you need to have another perspective on it. You're not going to get the alternative perspective from any of the mainstream media or the, you're not going to get it from the Sierra Club or 350.org or Inside Climate News because these groups, as exposed in Planet of the Humans, these groups are aligned with big money. They're not going to tell you the truth of so-called yeah. renewable energy. And how renewable can it be if it depends on a lot of mining of metals, lithium, aluminum, cobalt, copper, mm -hmm. lots mm -hmm. of plastics, you know, so just Yeah, saying. absolutely. It, it, it seems like, um, you know, it, it's, it's scary when a business, you know, obviously all businesses are money driven, but, um, just makes you wonder if they really care. Right. Well, I mean, you have to understand the true nature of business. You have to understand the true nature of media. You have to understand the true nature of government. So the true nature of business is they're there to make a profit. And they also, for the most part, own and sponsor the media. So you're not going to get the straight story from the media. The media is not a public service. It's not a nonprofit. It is a that well, there are nonprofit media outlets, but even those are usually owned by commercial or you know driven by commercial interests. Right. So you know, the, and the true nature of government is that currently, you know, government does some good things, <laughs> but you can almost name on one hand the good things government does: and Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, certain problems like certain programs like that that actually help people mostly what government does is it is owned by the people that buy the politicians etc and you know the, the 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 people who have the money to buy the politicians are able to bend public policy to suit their will so uh, so you have to understand the true nature of media government and business and they honestly they don't care about us. They don't. You know, government is going to be mainly, and, and government could be taken back and operate of, by, and for the people. So famously, Abraham Lincoln said, we are a government of the people, by the people, for the people. If only that were true. Your government does some good things, but it is it, that's like 10% of it. The rest of it is government doing bad things because it's, you have to look at who controls it. Yeah. So uh, what do you think is a good solution to the individual?
individual that has a careful fear of um, large corporations and the government. Who cares? You mean, what, what should government? individuals do? Well, individuals should get informed. And, you know, you can only get informed, I believe, from independent media. You know, independent media are the people that are, you know, I can, I can name about a dozen, uh, you know, maybe up to 20 sources of good information. Just, you know, you can only consume, consume so much. There might be hundreds of independent media you know, outlets, but, you know, the books I named by Lear Keith and, and, uh, and Derek Jensen, uh, the Michael Moore, you have to decide for yourself what's independent and what's reliable. So, you know, get your media, get your information from certain, you know, from sources that you trust that are independent of Wall Street, et cetera. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get good, reliable information from cable news. You're not going to get it from the major national newspapers or any social media or online media that is controlled by those sources. You really have to go out of your way yeah. to find good information. You also yeah. have to, you know, you have to, we have to know, I mean, the climate movement needs to know how systematically we are being misled. This gets back to like, you know, I, Noam Chomsky, Michael Parenti, and somebody else. Uh, oh, uh, Matt Taibbi. Uh, those are the uh, three people that have written just excellent books on how the media really works. Noam Chomsky's book written with Richard Herman, uh, with Edward Herman is, is like, okay, here's how the media really works. And it's, it's like what I was telling you. The only thing that get the only kind of information that gets to us through the corporate for-profit media is that which is not unflattering to the big companies, the pharmaceutical companies, the food companies, the fossil fuel mm -hmm. companies, et cetera. So as opposed to what? As opposed, you know, most people in the climate movement, sadly, are they 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 tend to be upper middle class white people. They they the system has worked for them and they tend to believe that when they listen to NPR, they're getting good information. They tend to believe that when they watch MSNBC, they're getting good information. Mm -hmm. When they read the New York Times, they think they're getting good information. And they're not because the media is a consumer product. It is, you know, Matt Taibbi writes really insightfully about this. His book is Hate Incorporated. And it's like, okay, in the 90s, when cable news became a thing, it used to be all the news was kind of targeted toward middle America. And then in the 90s, uh, Fox News started targeting conservatives. MSNBC started uh, targeting liberals. And then it became very tribalistic. Mm -hmm. Also in the late 80s, early 90s, the, the Cold War was over. And we couldn't, I mean, we still vilify communism and Russia, but, but to some extent, we started vilifying each other. So Democrats vilify Republicans, Republicans vilify Democrats, and, and it's, it's just this huge mind game. And so we have a climate movement that to me is relatively uninformed and misled and unaware that whether it's media, whether it's political parties, you have well-intentioned people supporting some of the worst institutions on earth that are, that are literally organized crime. I mean, the, to me, the major political parties and the major media outlets are literally organized crime, always drumming for wars of aggression, which is just murder on steroids, you know? So are we getting yeah. too far off track? <laughs> I don't think so. I, I, as you're talking about this, um, I, I'm thinking about how it, it seems like, tell me if I'm wrong, but it, it seems like um, everybody is definitely getting misled. Um, it, it seems like, it, how do I word this? It, it, it's, it's getting more popular uh, to care about the environment right now, but, but it, it's, it is being misled. Like, I don't know if you've noticed, but grocery stores have a lot more plant-based products, dairy-free products. You notice Dunkin' Donuts has like gluten-free this, dairy-free that. And it's just very interesting because it, it seems like the, they're, 
um, catering the saving the environment into a sellable product um, that entice people like upper middle class um, you know white people who happen to be in the Duncan line and <laughs> think they're saving the planet by ordering something plant-based mm -hmm. right. right I just I just find it fascinating I was just kind of what I was thinking about as you were talking about all of that um, well, one thing that the powers that be want from us is to stay in our role as consumers yeah. They don't want us to exercise our power as citizens. So they want us to they they want us to believe that we can shop our way to a better world. Mm -hmm. you know? So let's talk about well, the plant based a better world. <laughs> yeah. So tell me tell me what you think or what you know about a plant based diet. I mean, I've probably shared some of it with you, but you know you're an independent thinker. So tell me tell me give, give me the impressions that you get from that. Um, initially I think veganism, I don't know if that necessarily means avoiding meat though, but, um, I plant-based meaning, um, you know, coming from plants. Um, yeah. I feel like there, I feel like nowadays just with the amount of processing and food, uh, preservatives and, you know, everything going through a machine in a factory, I feel like there's a gray area between like true plant-based foods and processed plant-based foods. Oh yeah, um, plant-based foods can be heavily processed. You yeah. can conceivably have plant-based food. I mean, I get, you know, I, I go to the farmer's market once a week and I get sustainably regeneratively raised pork and I also get some vegetables. I mean, the vegetable, the fresh local vegetables I get are definitely plant-based and they're not raised with any kind of pesticides or synthetic fertilizers and they are very good for you. Mm -hmm. But let, let's talk about meat. So we hear that, you know, that meat is bad, that cows are bad, that cows fart, that's methane. We hear cows use way too much, um, you know, they use way too much water. If you can consider the, the, the water that's dedicated to the grains that they eat, et cetera. But let's have a different ang angle on cows. So you know, cows, pork, chickens, you name the type of meat. A lot of them are, are raised under circumstances that are really bad, bad for animal cruelty, bad for, you know, water usage, water pollution. I mean, CAFO, C-A-F-O, Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations are these factory farms that are, they're cruel. They are carbon intensive. You don't want to work in them. You don't want to live near them. And, but that's not how animals have to be raised. Uh, so you can raise animals, you know, animals should be raised in an environment that, you know, that is pleasant and they, they should be raised on farms that are biologically diverse. When you have biologically diverse farms, then your animal is in an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. You know, we want our food to be raised ecologically. For our food to be raised ecologically, that means one farm is going to have multiple kinds of livestock and it's going to have multiple uh, kinds of plants. You want, you're going to be avoiding synthetic fertilizers. You're going to be avoiding all kinds of pesticide, pesticides. Biocide is a general term for pesticides. Pesticide is a general term that can include fungicides, insecticides, and herbicides. You know, the insecticides are neurotoxins, bad stuff. The herbicides are, are you know, not all herbicides are toxic, but many are. Synthetic fertilizers are bad. So you want your food to be raised on a farm that has this biologically diverse so that it's going to, you, you have your, you know, what is a cow in its natural environment? A cow in its natural environment is going to live most or all of its life eating grass. Mm -hmm. So, and, and a cow in its natural environment is hopefully going to drink water that is not from city water. It's going to be drinking uh, rainwater that is captured. And uh, so, uh, plus, uh, you know, cows can be, cows and other grazing animals can be an extremely important and vital way of capturing carbon because when a cow is grazing and when the 
when the past, when it's rotated from pasture to pasture day by day, and it doesn't come back to that same spot for three months or six months or nine months, depending on the circumstances, that's mimicking nature. And that is, yeah. So, so that's nomadic in nature, right? right? They, they, yeah. they travel over time. Yeah. Right. So, you know, think of the bison in North America. They, they're going northward in the springtime and they're going southward in, and they're going to be bunched up because they're, that they bunch up to protect themselves from predators. They also move because they don't want to eat the grass where they've been pooping. You know, cows are funny like that. So mm -hmm. they're moved, they're, they're bunched up and they're moving. Under those circumstances, you're going to have, they're going to eat the grass and move on and not come back mm -hmm. for months. And so when you're mimicking that, there's this whole thing called holistic grazing. It's when you're trying to mimic the natural uh, resource. So when you're rotating your cattle strategically, then that grass is going to grow so much faster. And it's growing, so it's going to be more productive, but it's also growing roots. And when you have that, you're, you're, the, the roots of the grass are going to grow faster. When roots are growing, they're injecting carbon into the soil. Yep. And they're keeping the moisture in the soil. They're right. holding the soil down. Right. And th their, their hooves are poking <laughs> into the ground. When, when cattle have been trampling an area, it, it disturbs the ground in a way that's healthy. Those hoof prints can capture rain when it comes down. The manure is going to invigorate the grass and the manure is going to invigorate the life of the soil. So we want our soils to be, uh, you know, soil health. There's five principles of soil health. We could go into that at some point, but, you know, yeah, it's, it seems like uh, like everything in nature happens for a reason down to, like you said, their hooves stomping the ground and that's able to capture, you know, a little puddle of water. So, you know, it just makes sense that any disruption that humans have on the environment is going to be detrimental in some way. And, you know, holistic planned grazing is this whole big thing that was developed. The, the godfather of this whole movement is Alan Savory. He has done great work. People are using his methods. And uh, so when, when people say, okay, let, let's, when people say you need a plant-based diet, they're ignoring the, I mean, if somebody doesn't want to kill animals for food, that's their business. But when you categorically say meat is bad for the environment, what does that even mean? You know, it's completely uninformed. Plus, let's talk about how plant-based foods are raised. So plant-based foods can be raised ecologically and sustainably. But the, you, you're, if you're going to raise food ecologically and sustainably, it needs to include perennials. It needs to include like perennials, meaning trees, woody bushes, as a mix of the whole thing. What we've done you know, civilizations have collapsed because they ruin their soils. You ruin your soils with too much annual crops. Annual crops include corn, wheat, soybeans. That, and so when you say plant-based diet, when I hear plant-based diet, I hear monocultures. So monocultures is like, Corn as far as the eye can see, soy as far as the eye can see, wheat as far as the eye can see. And when you have like one crop as far as the eye can see, that crowds out nature. Yeah, there's nature no is diverse. What? Yeah. Uh, yeah, just like you said, I said there's no biodiversity. Right. And another thing that harms the biodiversity is not just the fact that it's a monoculture. But it's also the fact that many of these monocultures, and I know, you know, vegans would probably love to get food that's not raised with synthetic fertilizers, it's not raised with, you know, biocides, et cetera, mm -hmm. not raised with genetically modified corn and soy, but 
you know, you're, you're like, you're, so plant-based can mean so many things, but you have this, you know, impossible foods, impossible burgers, heavily processed, oh, yeah. you know, are, you have to know where you, if you're, if you are, if you choose to be vegan, you have to know where your food is coming from. But this broad brush saying plant-based diet is better for the planet. Well, it, it, you're. Yeah. You I mean, as long as a, a large corporation is taking over something, they're going to find the cheapest, uh, most effective way to make the most profit off of it. And if they're going to take over plant-based, I mean, <laughs> You know, it's gonna it's gonna turn into the same problem as what they say the meat industry is causing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, plant based as a rule is not any better than animal products, and animal products can be really vital, uh, a, a really great strategy. And plus, animal products are are nutrient they can be nutrient dense. You know, you want to get animals that have been raised in a biologically diverse farm with no antibiotics and, you know, toxic types of parasite control and pest control. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, meat can be done right. And uh, just because something's plant-based, that doesn't mean it was done right. Right. A couple of resources I can recommend on this one of them is by is a book called The Vegetarian Myth by Lierre Keith. Another book is called uh, Defending Beef by Nicole ha Nicolette Han Neiman or Nyman. And they're both just excellent. They, they talk about mainly the ecology and the nutritional aspects of of beef and meat and there's a facebook group called eom ethical omnivore movement which is good so and and one one thing here is, is nutrient density you know is it possible for people to be well nourished on an exclusively plant-based diet well Lear keith personally she was a vegan for a long time and she had to, writes about the health issues that she's had as a result of that. Another thing they've talked about is like, we hear as a matter of conventional wisdom. Like, like I grew up in a home where my dad had heart disease and the conventional wisdom then and now was that you have to reduce your cholesterol, reduce your saturated fats, et cetera. And there's another side to that whole thing. There's another side to that whole thing. And Nicolette Han Nyman and Lear Keith, they get way into the research that relates to uh, meat. And they, you know, I, I don't know how to sum it up except to say that it laid waste to all the assumptions that I, that I had about it. And one thing you can say is that there was a, a British researcher who was really, he was given a hard way to go. You know, there's science and truth, and then there's conventional wisdom, and they're two different things. And this researcher, uh, he, he said the following thing, which I think turns out to be true. If humans and our ancestors have eaten this for thousands of years, it's probably good for you. If it's brand new, and we have not eaten this for very long, then it might not be good for you. Yeah. And one thing Nicolette Hahn Nyman, Nyman says is that a lot of the health issues that are have been falsely attributed to beef are actually more about sugar, refined sugar. Yeah. It makes sense. It, it makes it, that all of that makes me think about. Um, the food pyramid that I was taught mm -hmm, you know, at the mm -hmm. school and how the bottom is the most important. It's the biggest part. Uh, and the bottom to my knowledge had, had always been grains and wheat and, you know, just your bread, your pastas, all stuff that I grew up and realized are, are not necessarily the most important. Um, a lot of the stuff at the bottom of the pyramid 
uh, nowadays it's hard to find not processed. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just, I find that fascinating. Well, one more thing about food and then we'll go on to like the strategy, hearts, climate strategies. Mm -hmm. But what was I gonna say about, oh, nutrient de density. So the uh, there's been a tremendous decline in the nutritional value of food in the last 70 years. 70 years ago it was 1950. It was right after World War II and a lot of changes started occurring in agriculture after World War II. We started, destroy, we started doing everything we could to destroy our soils. Well, all good intentions, I'm sure, maybe. But, you know, it takes, it takes healthy soil to deliver the nutrients to the plant. And you have to have nutritious plants, whether, you know, you might be eating the plant directly like apple or banana, and orange, wheat, corn, or, or an animal might be eating the plant. But, you know, an orange might have, you know, 10 to 30% of the nutrition that it used to. Uh, carrots, name your, and it's, it's easy to see why, if you understand how soil biology works, uh, that you have to have that soil biology to deliver nutrients to the plant. Like, you know, iron is a mineral that comes to the soil, that comes from the soil and it has to be delivered through an ecosystem. Here's how the soil ecosystem works. So we talked about plants have, you know, plants get sunlight. They use that sunlight to make sugars. They take some of their sugars, about a third on average, and they inject that, the sugars are carbohydrates. So they're injecting their sugars into the soil through the root tips. The, those sugar, the, and the, the soil bacteria go, yippee, sugar. So they, the, and it, and so bacteria and fungi, among other things, are attracted to those root tips. And then they set up this whole ecosystem. Mm -hmm. and, and it's it's good to have a diversity of plants, you know, and, and it's good to not destroy the health of the soil through synthetic fertilizers, through biocides, through tillage. And it, it's good to have a diversity of plants. It's good for the soil to be protected. Like if you just harvested a crop, it's good for the soil to be protected with organic matter. It's good for the soil to always have living roots in it. Something on the order of half of the agricultural fields in the world at any given time are bare because the crop has been harvested. And that's a, that's a cause for bad soil health. And it's also a cause for climate change because those bare fields are hot plates. So yeah. there's a lot of reasons to want healthy soil. And that's one of the five strategies of, uh, so yeah. we've, we've well, been, what you go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Soil health. And it seems like a lot of the five strategies go hand in hand, too, because you're talking about soil health and that soil health um, has to do with, um, you know, the ecosystem under the soil um, and ecosystems is another one of the five or, or six strategies um, and animal engineers. I would I would call fungi animal engineers for right. sure. Right. Um, I think there are animal engineers under the soil that are at a microscopic level that are just as important as the ones that are the size of grubs. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've, I've heard that when you have healthy soil, the, the animal biomass, so biomass is a word for the amount of the, the amount of living things, you know, subtract the water, and, yep. but just the amount of organic material contained in a living thing so most of the biomass in the world is plants. So take that out. And when most of the rest of the biomass in the world, there's more biomass, there's like five to 10 times as much biomass underneath the ground as there is on top. There's a it, whole world under the ground. Yeah. So when you say there's that much more, are you taking out plants? Yeah, other than plants. Which is still, it's still such a large number. I remember you uh, mentioned that to me last time and my jaw just dropped. Uh, and it just makes so much sense to take care of underneath the ground, um, considering there's so much biomass. I mean, you'd think that with that much biomass, it would, it would have a huge effect on climate change and the, the Earth's overall health. 
exactly. So that's why I like I have been developing this list of five strategies, and the or now it's six. But ecological function is like one term that I'm not sure if it should be included in that list because everything else lends to the ecological function. And what I've come to understand, at least this is the way I think about it. So, you know, we're, we're accustomed to thinking every now and then you'll read a article or something that says, hey, we need to plant trees because plants absorb carbon or, hey, maybe bamboo is really good for absorbing carbon. You know, every now and then there's a new miracle plant that's so good at absorbing carbon, but it, yeah, yes, plants absorb carbon, but they're going to do the best job of absorbing carbon if they're in a high functioning ecosystem mm -hmm. because we have carbon in us. Fungi has carbon, bacteria has carbon, the insects, the grubs, the worms, the pill bugs, all the things that are underneath the soil, they have carbon in them. Mm -hmm. So I, and carbon and water, so carbon and water flow together. Whenever you have a certain amount of carbon in the soil, you have eight, the, the, one gram of carbon is responsible for absorbing eight grams of water hmm. when it rains. So if you have carbon rich soils, then you're going to, your rainfall, you're going to capture more of your rainfall. So carbon and water going into the soil, mm -hmm. carbon and water going into the plants, carbon and water going into the fungi and the microorganisms. And, and, it, it, and if you have a functioning ecosystem, then it's not going to be as vulnerable to threats threats in the form of pests, threats in the form of drought, threats in the form of, you know, environmental toxins. It's going to be a, a, a diverse, high-functioning ecosystem is going to be more self-sustaining. Yeah, and that even includes um, organic matter. Like, anything dead is important, too, and um, like leaves, limbs, sticks, uh, any kind of yard waste, which, you know, I see every single day. Uh, one of the neighbors has their lawn services. They're with a leaf blower. I hear that leaf blower more than I hear the lawnmower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just blowing everything away. And a lot of those leaves contain, um, you know, potential pollinators and um, fungi and or organic matter of all kinds that could potentially decompose and fertilize the earth at a local level. But. Right. So one way of looking at that is just in the broadest terms, we need to, you know, there are things that we need to do more of and things that we need to do less of. Mm -hmm. So we need to do less of the destructive things and more of the things that are good. You know, leaf blowers are bad. Mowers are bad. I mean, everything in moderation, but we're not doing this stuff in moderation. Mm -hmm. Plus you're, you're sending away, like when you put your organic waste on the curb and then, oh, I need to go get some mulch. So you run to Home Depot and get the mulch. Well, your organic waste could serve as mulch. Yeah. But uh, so listen, let's talk about the, the five strategies. Yeah. Or, and we'll probably, you know, want to wrap it up in about, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. We can always do this another time, but so what I'm going to say is to me more important and more effective than a hyper focus on CO2, a hyper focus of reducing on reducing fossil fuels, a hyper focus on renewable energy, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we need to deal with fossil fuels, but for entirely different reasons than we usually yes fossil fuels emit carbon dioxide but that is a long-term project and Wait, in the mean like it has short-term results too like a long-term right. project with short-term results because okay we can figure out all these ways to suck the carbon out of the air but our mm -hmm. earth is still dry and and bare of uh, any kind of biodiversity anymore yeah right you know if so the thing is there is no there's nothing better the natural systems mm -hmm. for sucking carbon out of the air. We have these multi-billion dollar projects called CCS, Carbon Capture and Storage. It's a racket. There's a really funny video that I've posted recently that 
it's a racket. And it's, it's another example of corporations are lining up, wanting to profit from yep. pretending to solve the problem. They don't, their shareholders don't care if they actually solve the problem. They just care if the stock price goes up. Mm-hmm. But there's, you know, carbon capture and storage is a lot of money to do almost nothing. We could be taking that carbon, we could be putting it in the soil, we're putting it into the plants, we're putting it into living ecosystems. So let's talk about how to do that. Five strategies, plant matter, organic matter, healthy soils, animal engineers, and earthworks, all of which adds up to ecological function, high functioning ecosystems. Mm -hmm. So plant matter, deforest less, (laughs) you know, we need to, if we could just leave our forests alone, leave our trees alone, not every single one of them. You might want to harvest some of them, but the amount of deforestation that's going on, some of it in the name of renewable energy. Yeah. We have, we have, we have clear cut, we're clear cutting forests for, renew, for renewable energy. It's not renewable, it's destructive. Right. Exactly. That's not but, cradle to cradle. M- most of the so called renewable, much, if not most, of the so called renewable energy is clear cutting forests, turning them into wood chips, and burning them which is more carbon intensive than coal and it's dirtier than coal. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me a little bit about earthworks? Okay, so earthworks is whatever you do to the ground. One of the main thing, like let me give you, swale is is something we should, swale on contour is something we should all know. So a swale is, is, is a ditch, except usually when you think about a ditch, a ditch is usually a ditch directs water downhill. A yeah. swale is just the opposite. A swale is is on con- a swale is runs roughly at a level, mm-hmm. and the purpose is to slow the progress of the downhill progress of water. Uh huh. So we want these swales on on contour. We want to be if, if you have water rushing. So if you have water rushing downhill, it's going to rush off of your property and it's not going to do anybody any good. It's going to go into the storm drains. So what we do, you know, we dig and swales can be small or large. It can be small as a shovel or it can be large, like you can have heavy equipment to build a swale on a, on a larger type of situation. Mm-hmm. And a variation on that is something called a key line system. A variation on a key line system is something called a master line system. But it's where if you look at a contour map, you have these lines, you know, a contour map by definition is these lines are at a certain, these ran, lines represent a certain elevation. Mm-hmm. So the key line system is when you're basically digging a rut in the ground along a certain elevation. So that when the water flows down, it soaks in. And to me, okay, this is Hart Hagen talking, not speaking for anybody else. But to me, we could solve two thirds of the world's problems if we rehydrate the earth. Mm-hmm. We rehydrate the earth by capturing water where it falls. Earthworks have like, a, go ahead. It seems like it's, it's a really good first step too. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we talk about the, you know, the water cycle, and it seems like that's an excellent first step for everything. The first step for creating an ecosystem from the soil down, um, a great first step into potentially growing native plants around it, um, and a great s- first step into keeping precipitation consistent. Obviously, one person isn't going to make a difference in the precipitation, but, you know, all of that, it, it does seem like a good first step. So I oh, see why you, yeah. you see that um, digging these holes would would create a wonderful effect. Right. So, you know, one question is whether to do the earthworks first or whether to plant first. And that yeah. depends on the situation. Uh, sometimes you want to do the earthworks first. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other way of looking at it is kind of a big, it can be a, a, a bigger investment, but the, you can also do it at the same time. Like if you build, I was uh, watching, Jeff Lawton is a major giant in the permaculture world. 
and he, he was talking about, you know, you build your swale and you want to have trees on the downhill side of the swale. Or if it's mm -hmm. a, an arid region, you want trees on the downhill side and the uphill side of the swale. But in, in, in also, I was talking to a friend of mine in Pittsburgh the other day, and she was saying, look, I have this swale that catches the runoff from my neighbor's driveway. And so a swale almost always goes hand in hand with a row of plants of some sort. So you, you're doing bo both. And you know those plants are going to probably do better if they're the right plants. They're probably going to do better if they have that water being captured. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Kind of like the chicken and the egg. Right. <laughs> now you right exactly exactly. And you mentioned and, and it's also it's chicken and the egg. And it's also all these things work together. It's a together. system that works together if you build the system, grow the system. Right. And so you were talking about precipitation. So you know we have this oversimplified understanding of water cycles from our textbook. It's like here's the ocean, and even meteorologists today to some extent, they still have this oversimplified notion of what causes precipitation. They're not, the majority viewpoint is not yet acknowledging the importance of forests in creating their own rain. Mm -hmm. So forests, forest, for example, forests, but all plant matter to some extent. So forests create their own rain, partly because they transpire water. They contribute water vapor into the air. They also create some of their own precipitation mm -hmm. because precipitation requires a nuclear. You have the, you know, these water, little bitty water droplets. They're not going to coalesce into a raindrop unless there is a nucleus. So a nucleus can come in the form of salts. It can come in the form of, there are three different ones. Uh, salts is one, and uh, the third one escapes me, but a, a very unrecognized source of precipitation is a bacteria called Aerobacter. Louis Pasteur, the famous microbiologist, discovered the Aerobacter, but he didn't know what it did. But Aerobacter is like, plants have this, Aerobacter inside them, and when their their little stomata is a little opening in the plant that they, they have, the stomata opens so that they can breathe in carbon dioxide and so they can breathe out oxygen and other things. But when they breathe out, they contribute Aerobacter to the air. That Aerobacter goes, you know, mixes in and forms the nucleus of raindrops. Uh -huh. And so it's a I, I've heard. I'm under the impression that the Aerobacter bacteria is responsible for much, if not most, of the rain in the world. That's super cool. It's super fascinating knowing that know. there's some kind of bacteria responsible for that. I just thought it was pure water. Uh, going. It, it's interesting because is this bacteria just incredibly light enough to evaporate with water vapor? Mm -hmm. It's just, it's very interesting. Right. Um, so so, this, so is this something that only comes from plants, this type of bacteria? Yes, we know that it comes from trees. It probably comes from other plants. We don't know what other plants it comes from. Yeah, but it, primarily plants. Yeah, I would, I assume, I, I assume that it's kind of, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Part of me wants to say, I mean, there are millions of species of bacteria. Yeah. And, and this one, I just know that it's a bacterium and it's the cause for much of the precipitation that we get. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you, if we want precipitation, we need forests. Yeah. And, uh, you know, not to mention forests have a lot more surface area for uh, water evaporation than the ocean. The ocean's just one flat surface, but the forest is, is limited to every single surface area of every leaf and vine and uh, grass. Exactly, isn't, isn't that fascinating? Yeah, it really goes to show how important it is. And right. it's, uh, just 
it makes it clear as day as to why it rains, you know, thousands of miles inland, because that's where trees are. And it's, it's not the rivers that are responsible for that necessarily. It's, it's mostly the forests, mostly right. the grasses. And you know, what you saw the, the prevailing winds in North America go which direction? Is it uh, southeast? Well, sometimes they come in from, you know, Gulf hurricanes, but prevailing winds are mainly west to east, you know, from the Pacific towards okay. the Atlantic. I know weather patterns kind of travel um, like northwest to southeast. Mm -hmm. Something right. like yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. So um, what's so Kentucky is in the eastern part of the United States. California is in the western, far western part of the United States. Mm -hmm. Which one gets more rain? Kentucky. Kentucky right. by far gets more rain. So the yeah. eastern half of the United States gets a lot more rain than the western. The western half of the United States mostly is, is famously dry. So it's responsible for uh, the rain here um, is is coming from forests in, in, inland, right? Whereas California technically depends on the Pacific Ocean, right? Right, right. yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's my observation. Yeah. And so how do you get any precipitation inland? It, it's, it's got to come from, it, it can't, you can't explain when you're hundreds or thousands of miles inland, you can't explain that by proximity to the ocean. Yeah. You, you have to explain it some other way. Rains also occur when the weather patterns are going up against a mountain and there are certain things that cause precipitation in those circumstances, but mainly you've got, I mean, yeah. I'm Make not a meteorologist, but what? Makes you think of rainforests. Rainforests mm -hmm. rain all day, every day. And it, 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 a lot of them aren't necessarily anywhere near a large body of water. Um, they're just so biodiverse um, that they're producing their own rain. Right. The, the two Russian scientists named Gorshkov and Marakeva that have done a lot of good work in this realm. And they just, they, they talk, they call it the biotic pump that forests actually pull rain, that they pull they pull wind, forests create their own wind because of differentials in temperature or pressure. I forget which, mm -hmm. but so they pull wind toward them. And so in South America, you've got the Amazon flowing west to east, and then you've got a, a, a river in the air flowing east to west. Mm -hmm. So that that it's that's that's a water cycle yeah and no matter where here's another thing no matter where you are even if it's a desert there's a whole lot of water in the air mm -hmm. uh, walter yenny says up to 50 centimeters of water in the air even over a desert the question is how can you make it precipitate yeah. And mainly you need you need plant matter Plants. to make it precipitate. You need that Arabacter bacteria to make it precipitate. Uh -huh. So here's how this connects to the news. You have, you know, I, I feel for people and I sympathize for people that are dealing with drought. But people don't know what causes drought and people don't know what causes desertification. Mm -hmm. We we deforest and we treat the soils badly, and we heat up the atmosphere through pavement and through heat domes caused by agriculture, that's causing desertification. It's causing aridification, which just means the air is drying out. It's causing a you know, deficit. It, it's causing the rains to go away. Even when like, here's this low pressure system that's coming over a city or an agricultural field and it would otherwise rain, but you have this heat dome, this high pressure, hot, dry air that is keeping, that is preventing precipitation mm -hmm. from penetrating that heat dome. Mm. And that's because 
that's because of what we've, and I'm going to, we've got to wrap it up here in a minute. We can always do this conversation again uh, sometime, but we, uh, don't you hate it when you lose your train of thought? So the heat well, dome. Yeah. We, we create the conditions that make, that make it not want to rain. Yeah. We, we create those conditions in, in so many different ways. It's like, there's a whole set of things that we should do that we don't. There's a whole other set of things that we don't do that we should. Mm -hmm. And if, if we were doing these things that we should, like, okay, leave the forest alone. You Maybe some sustainable har harvesting, but we're not doing that. We're rapidly and aggressively deforesting. Mm -hmm. And our farm, we could be getting much of our food from farms that include trees, biologically diverse farms that include yeah. chestnut trees and hazelnuts and walnuts and persimmons yeah. and pawpaws. We could be yeah. doing this. That contribute to the environment and participate right. in the environment and not work against the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is all good stuff. Beth, this has been a wonderful conversation. I'm really happy you could join me. Yeah, I've probably learned like 20 new things from this conversation. <laughs> well, uh, I'm going to end the recording, but hang on. We'll talk a little bit more. All Thank right. you to our audience for, for joining us. Now, let me see if I can end this recording smoothly. There we go.